Um, oh, well, welcome everybody from around the world. This is amazing. Um, welcome back. Um, uh, going to introduce Jim Colson. Jim is a wood scientist. Um, he's our go-to guy, uh, certainly on the UK Wood Committee and is turning out to be that way on the International Committee for um, identifying wood species. He was all over everything um, uh, when we were uh, in Ethiopia together. Um, indispensable. He's been um, the, uh, the director, a founder, and owner of TFT Wood Experts for 30 years. He's been um, uh, a NICOMOS member since the 1980s. Um, on the uh, UK Wood Committee and the International Committee. Um, and there's, a, there's, I can't say any more about him other than he's, um, he's an encyclopedia and he's amazing. So off you go, Jim. <laughs> wow, thanks, Doug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes, I've, I've really been in wood. Um, since the 1970s, I joined the then Timber Research Association, which does no longer exist. Um, but I was a, a training officer and then uh, what's called a regional officer. So I traveled the UK um, promoting the use of wood, seeing architects. And then when they were privatized at the beginning of the 90s, hence about 30 years ago, I, I quit the company and set up my own practice, which uh, happily has got a a reasonable reputation, uh, as well as being on ICOMOS. I'm on the UK Timber Grading Committee. I'm on the British Standard Committee to do with structural timber. I'm also on another British Standard Committee to do with sustainability in construction works. Um, about five years ago, I qualified as a chartered environmentalist and I was president of the Institute of Wood Science, which then was merged about 10 years ago into the Institute of Materials I'm now a fellow of the Institute of Materials. Um, so that, that's sort of me. Um, okay, shall we crack on? I'm going to give you a presentation. I've been asked to give you a presentation on the very basics of wood. If some of you know more about wood, then fine. Um, some of you who know less about the, the science of wood as a material and the niceties of how wood works as a material, this may be helpful to you. Um, if you know everything I'm going to say, then as my old tutor once said to me years ago, if you know everything, then you can go away from this with the satisfaction of knowing that you are the smart ass you thought you were. <laughs> so, right, let's, let's see if we what can- What did I tell you, everybody? <laughs> yeah, right, share. Let's uh, give you this now. If we do that now, can, can you see the presentation? And Vince, yes, Vince yes. Is holding his thumb up. Right. Okay. Now this is the one that was on the um, flyer that Vincent put out, and um, but he was pushing me to get my presentation and get a flyer. So really, this is just a general some pictures of stuff with wood. Almost nothing that's on these pictures I'm going to actually talk about. But I will put some examples at the end of my talk um, about some interesting and more historic uses of, of wood, since we are a, a sort of historic and heritage committee. Okay, so right, jumping straight in, if it's gonna, uh, right, why isn't, why isn't it, um, why isn't it wanting to, ah, there we are, right, okay. So we've got two sorts of wood, hardwoods and softwoods, which the names are very confusing because they're not necessarily hard and they're not necessarily soft because balsa wood is an extremely soft and squishy timber, but it's a hardwood and you, that's not you, Vincent, as I'm looking at you, but Y-E-W-U, is a softwood and it's anything but soft it's really very hard so not very helpful terms so we'll try and unravel what those terms mean this is a an idea of roughly of where the different types of timber are distributed so if i can you see me moving my cursor there vincent yeah, yeah. so the the green banding which is mainly across the top some of the, the dug is somewhere about where my <laughs> cursor is now i think um so the top of the world um, under the Arctic Circle, but all the sort of uh, boreal and, and northern temperate zones is where um, softwoods grow. Also, mountainous areas like the Himalayas and down here, down the Andes, uh, you will find some softwoods, either natural native softwoods or increasingly these days, 
plantations of softwoods from other parts of the world. So over here in, in, in New Zealand, for example, um, most of their um, normal construction industry is based upon a, um, an imported uh, softwood that, that comes from nowhere near. It comes from actually up here in Monterey. Um, they call it Monterey pine. We refer to it as, as radiata pine in, in the UK. So, and hardwoods, the brown, that's general areas where we get um, here in, in, in the USA, we've got the Appalachian Mountains and a bit up towards the Great Lakes. Uh, we've got stands of, of more traditional hardwoods you might think of as, as um, oak and, and elm and beech and, and of course up into Canada and, up, and also up the East Coast, Maine and so on. You've got lots of maple. I've been to various people's uh, uh, maple syrup distilleries up there. Very, very nice it is too. Uh, and then you've got lots of uh, hardwoods in India. Not terribly many exported but they do grow a lot of species. Mostly in the UK context, we get our woods from South America, from uh, West and Central Africa, and obviously some eucalyptus from Australia. Um, and of course, there are mixed uh, hardwoods and softwoods that grow across Europe. You get both growing in the European and some of the East Coast, USA and Canadian uh, areas. So you will get both. But the general principle is that the hardwoods like the warmer and the hotter climates, so temperate and tropical, and the softwoods tend to like a little bit of the warmer climates, but they especially like the colder climates. So that's why we tend to see the softwoods in the, in the colder parts of the world. Now, what are softwoods? Well, they're not woods that are soft. They are basically conifers. They are um, all the timber in the trunk of a tree that has needles rather than leaves and it has naked seeds which are exposed when the cone of the conifer opens. Um, you, you might say, if you know the yew tree, is not a conifer uh, per se. It, well, it, it is, but it isn't. It hasn't got a cone. It's got what looks like a berry, but it in fact is an open cup with the naked seeds inside it. So the, the, the posh word, remembering my name is Jim, the posh word for them is gymnosperms. <laughs> but that just means in Latin, naked seed. It doesn't mean I don't have sperm. Uh, I've got four children and two grandchildren, so that's fine. Yeah, all right, all right, Jim, move on. <laughs> move on, <laughs> thanks, Doug. Oh, okay, so hardwoods, they're not woods that are hard. They are the other sort of tree in the world. They're trees with leaves, and we tend to call them broadleaf trees, and they're trees with leaves and with some sort of fruit. Can be a nut, could be other sort of uh, fleshy fruit but the seed is protected inside some covering or casing rather than being fully exposed. And, and that's the difference between them. It's not that the wood is hard or the wood is soft, it's the type of tree it comes from. So it either comes from the trunk of a softwood conifer, and it's a very simple primitive structure, very much more simple and primitive than the broad leaves and the hardwood so-called come from the trunks of broad leaf trees. They could be temperate like oak, they could be tropical like mahogany or many, many others, but it's just the, the name, unfortunately, that's given in English to those types of timbers. I, I teach uh, timber in, in uh, grading in Germany, and the Germans have much more sensible words for them. The, uh, the conifer, they call Nadelholz, which is needle wood, and the hardwoods, they call Laubholz, which is leaf wood. Much more sensible, in my opinion, to call them needle wood and leaf wood than hard and soft, which gives them apparent properties that they don't necessarily have. Anyway, so let's have a look at some, some wood structure. Um, a common confusion people have is, is talking about the grain of wood, and people look at a nice piece of wood like this and go, wow, gosh, hasn't that got a wonderful grain? What they're really looking at is the figure, the pattern on the surface. The grain actually is the, the direction of the fibres, if you think of my fingers as the fibres in the wood, the grain direction is the wood fibres going along the line of those fibres. And we talk about along the grain, across the grain, you can talk about cross grain wood, cutting across the grain. That's the, the thing to think about, the direction of the wood fibres. And I might, um, again, if I was lecturing <laughs> in a class, I would be asking, where do you think the direction of the grain is? And a lot of people think that that is the direction of the grain because that's what it looks like. But that is the figure. The actual grain direction is going this way, vertically. This figure, this pattern is called fiddle back figure. 
It was used um, from the 1700s onwards for decorating the backs of fiddles before um, um, uh, uh, groups of musicians had a conductor. The lead um, fiddle player would usually start playing and then stand up with his back to the audience, conducting with his bow before um, the conductor's baton was invented. And then um, he would then be holding his fiddle and holding it backwards onto the audience. And it had a nice pattern on it, which was this, which is a ripple pattern. The grain is waving in and out of the surface of the wood and giving different reflections. The, the dark banding is where the light is absorbing into the wood and the lighter colored banding is where the light is reflecting back out of the wood. So that's the, the pattern. It's a waving or, or wiggly grain, but the direction of the fibers is actually going vertically. And it's called fiddle back figure because it was used for decorating the backs of, of the early conductors fiddles. But grain is not the pattern, pattern is the figure. Okay, looking into a tree, this is a pine tree. If you cut the tree down and look at it, you might find two bands of color. On the outside is the sap wood. That's the newer wood that conducts the juice, the sap of the tree. Word of caution, sap is not the sticky stuff that oozes out of wood when you cut it. As many people call it that. Uh, the gooey stuff, the stuff that comes out is sticky in warm weather is called resin. And that's a protection for the tree against injury to stop infection getting into the, the wounds of the tree, like a broken branch or whatever. Um, the sap is the juice of the tree. Again, the Germans, the word is Saft, which is exactly the same word as their word for juice. So apple Saft is apple juice and Baum Saft is tree juice or sap. And the sap wood is the newer wood. The, the trees start at the beginning, grow a ring, and they keep growing rings every year until they get to the size of the tree that we cut down. So the newest, very newest wood is immediately under the bark. That is this year's wood. And the oldest wood is right in the center of the tree many, many years ago. But obviously as the tree keeps growing, if it keeps growing, then the center part, the heart of the tree, that will keep on growing out and more of the sap wood that was will turn into heartwood in coming years and the sapwood, if the tree keeps growing, will extend further and further out. So it's not a fixed thing. It only stops when we cut down the tree. Now, we can't always see the heartwood. It's not always got a separate color, but the heartwood and sapwood are always there. Pale colored timbers like, this is pine, but pale colored timbers like spruce or um, like maple, for example, um, you won't see a boundary difference between sapwood and heartwood, but they're still there. The structure is slightly different. The, the physical structure is much the same. The cells are the same. The strength is the same. But something that is different is in the heartwood is sometimes certain trees, and it's usually the darker ones, change the, the, the food that was stored inside the tree that it hasn't used, and they chemical changes happen that make it sometimes go darker and sometimes give it a give the wood a greater resistance to rot we call that natural durability in this sense of wood science durability does not mean um, the ability to resist wear or erosion it means the ability to resist rot so when we talk about a durable timber we mean something that has natural chemicals inside its hard heart wood that can resist rot but the sapwood of all species, every single timber in the world, the sapwood of all species will not resist decay. It will rot, it will stain very easily. So if you are using a durable timber and you've looked up a timber and the records say, yes, this timber is durable, please remember if you're going to use it in a high humidity or an outdoor or wet situation, cut off the sapwood. Otherwise it will rot. Okay, so. Just a couple of examples of how big trees can Ed? be. Not so, yes. Don't. Yeah. Yeah. Very very quickly. Um, yep. uh, Vincent Vincent wanted to know what wood the the violin was, and Susanna thought it was maple. Um, it, it is actually sycamore, which is a very close ah. relative of maple. Sycamore and maple are both in the genus Acer, and they both can exhibit. Not every tree, but uh, log buyers look for. Um, sycamore trees that have um, this wavy grain and indeed I think in North America very likely they will have some 
um, maple for that same purpose. But of right. course, the, the traditional um, 17, 1800s fiddles that this came from um, would have been made from, from sycamore. But yes, good oh, question. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Um, yeah, this, this, just to, as an example, that a lot of people think that, that the hardwood trees must be big and the softwood trees must be small. Broadleaves are huge and conifers are tiny. Here is a Sitka spruce, um, which was brought over when, when the British first opened up the west side of Canada. This comes from uh, Sitka Bay in, in, in the west of Canada. And um, our forests in the UK are now full of this because that's what we've planted for fast growth softwoods in our forest in the UK. But this one was planted about 170 years ago in the 1840s, 1850s. That's my son, Neil. And at that time um, he is, and he was then um, about 15 stone and six foot three. So from that, you can see how big the tree is. He's not a toddler, he's a grown adult. And that's how big that tree is. So pretty impressive, I think. Yes, no? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And here's a hardwood, a broadleaf tree. This is in a, a, a Greek village I visited a few years ago. And it's over a thousand years old. That is one single tree covering the entire village square. And you can see this child sitting on just one branch. <laughs> that branch is as big as most trees. And that's a plain tree, uh, like we have in a lot of our city centers, both in England and in Europe. Um, plain trees are very good at absorbing pollution. Um, uh, and they have these um, disc shaped pieces that fall off the bark they absorb the pollution put it into the bark and then these little um about the size of if you're old enough to remember an old english penny about um what 30 millimeters diameter or so uh, they, they they fall off and, and the pollution comes off with them so that's why city centers plant them because they are good at cleaning pollution out of city centers um next step into the tree if we look a bit closer at the the, the tree trunk we might see the growth rings and we should see in, in conifers especially, we should see two separate bands, a lighter color and also lighter texture, softer texture band and a darker color, harder texture band. And the first, these, these, both these parts of the ring grow within the same year of growth. So the first part of the ring grows in the early part of the season. And that is when the tree is just starting growing again after its winter rest and the wood cells are very wide open. They have a thin wall and a wide open uh, tube in the middle that is there for conducting the sap during the early life of the tree in that new year. The darker part happens later on in the season because if the tree grows, if the, if the conifer, it's a softwood we're talking about here, if the conifer grows uh, all the lightweight open thin wall cells, great for conducting sap but not great for strength and in the winter storms it'll just blow the tree over so it needs to put some tough thick material so in the later part of the same year it then thickens up the material and creates um, more dense cells with a very small hole almost no conduction of any juice but a lot of strength in the wood cell walls and because they grow in the early part or the late part of the year guess what we call them the early wood and the late wood. In very old textbooks, you might see them called spring wood and summer wood, but that's not very accurate because they don't just grow early wood in the spring and late wood in the summer. It depends on the where they are growing, what the species is, uh, what the local climate is like. So we tend to call them now early wood and late wood, but it's the proportion, the amount of early wood to late wood that affects the, the strength and the working properties of any softwood. And here's an example of a British grown softwood with a mass of very low density early wood and a very, very narrow band of late wood. So it's very fast grown and it's very low density, very low strength and very poor texture, very poor quality timber. Whereas the slow grown Scandinavian uh, pines and spruces as you get in Sweden, Finland, etc., will have very close together, much closer together bands of early wood and late wood. And the closer they are, the denser the timber, the stronger the timber, and the finer texture you get when you're working it. So here's a, a look, um, end grain on, we're still looking down the end of the log, we haven't changed the axis that we're looking at, but here we are under a microscope and you can see these are what the softwood cells, the tracheids as they're called, the posh word, tracheid is like your trachea in your throat, it's just um, a word for a conducting tube, 
and this has been stained purple to make it show up because wood is almost transparent when you put it a thin slice under a microscope. Here is one year's growth ending on the right. Here is the next year's early wood growing, wide open cells, thin walls, and then a sudden transition to the same year, the late wood. You can see how the cells are smaller, thicker, denser, much more small hole. So their main structure is for holding the tree up Whereas in the early wood, their main function is to get the juice up the tree, to get the liquid up, to get the food made in the leaves and to disperse the food around the, the growing part of the sapwood in that year's growth. And there it stops and there's another year's growth carrying on. So uh, and this is a pine. Um, this is what pine looks like under a microscope, by the way. Now, the next picture, we're going to the um, side view. Uh, it's called the radial section because we're looking here at rays. These are bands of cells. They are continuous, but because of the slice being very thin and the rays wiggle about a little bit, the, um, the, uh, the ray in this slice doesn't appear to be continuous, but they are. And they go horizontally across the tree, whereas the, the main cells, the tracheids, go vertically up the tree. They're a bit like a finger joint. You can see that some of them end in a point they sort of mesh into each other like a finger joint, um, and then the rays cut across them. The rays are for conducting um, uh, foodstuffs into the tree when it's needed, and for conducting waste products out of the tree when it's needed. And the trees do, do ooze waste products out uh, when they're living in the forest, and when they're coming to uh, maturity, they also transfer materials into the, the back into the heartwood, which is what I was saying earlier, some of those foodstuffs and products that it doesn't need. Sometimes things it catches out of the ground can be stored in the heartwood out of harm's way. A good timber uh, example of a timber like that is Iroko from West Africa that grows in areas where it pulls silicates out of the soil and it then uh, puts those silicates out of harm's way into its heartwood, which is fine for the tree, not fine for us because when we cut Iroko frequently, we can blunt our tools because uh, the silicates form um, very hard crystals which, which knacker cutting edges of tools. So um, some, of the, some of the deposits inside heart, heart, heart woods are not, not good for us. Now that was softwood, conifers. This is what some hardwoods look like. These are called ring porous, only oaks, ashes, elms, chestnuts and hickories in North America. The first four occur in Europe and America. The last one, we don't have examples naturally in, in, in Europe, but it grows in America. But all those five species groups are called ring porous because the early wood ring, the early wood band is made of a band of big, fat, wide open tubes called pores. And then the gray material in this black and white photograph, those are fibers. So that's the difference between hardwoods and softwoods. Softwoods have tracheids, one cell that changes its structure to make early wood for, for liquid conduction or, or a thicker cell to make the late wood for strength. In hardwoods, their evolution happened about 100 million years after the conifers and they produce pores, which are big fat drain pipe tubes, which do the liquid conduction only, and fibers, which are different, which do the strength and the early wood and late wood in ring porous, only in ring porous timbers, are made of these two separate bands of two separate types of cells, only in those five groups of timbers. Most of the wood in the world is hardwoods, most of it's in the tropics, there are thousands of species of timbers, and there are a number of um, also species in the, the temperate areas. We've mentioned maple and sycamore, there's, there's birch, there's beech, there's many, many, many others, which all have this structure where the pores, the darker pieces in this uh, photograph, are scattered around or diffused, as the posh term is, across the whole of the cross section. So there's no obvious early wood and late wood. Then there is a stop to the year's growth, and that's a band of special material. Sometimes it's extra fibers, sometimes it's food storage material, which makes the growth ring band. This actually is um, American whitewood, or you may know it as tulip wood. If you've heard of that, who was our New York guy? Uh, heard of tulip wood? Yeah, yeah. unmute if you are. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, its scientific name is Liriodendron tulipifera. I'm gonna have to go for one second, the cat's meowing to get out. Sorry about this. <laughs> Vincent, do you want to say something about Iroka and 
Hiroko yes. re reacting to finishes. Yeah, so, so um, I found this out early on when I, was, when I started restoring furniture. And um, you try and polish Hiroko and it would react with, with um, shellac or um, some other types of finishes. And it must be that the silica, uh, it, you know, the, it must be what Jim was saying about the silica being in present. So uh, you, we normally had to seal it. I'm not, I'm not sure what we sealed it with. Um, we had to seal it and then we could polish over the top. But it, yeah, it, it reacts. Right. It doesn't take a finish. It's too, there's also quite a lot of oil in Aroka, as Jim said as well. Yeah, and, and also because of these diffuse porous timbers, every, it says here, all tropical woods, every single tropical timber has diffuse porous structure because there is no obvious early wood or late wood or even very obvious growth rings in tropical timbers. In fact, tropical timbers, you can't count the growth rings and age the tree because they don't have a stop and a start like the temperate timbers do. So you can cut down a pine tree in Scandinavia, an oak tree in New York, and you can count the rings and give a reasonable estimate of its age. If you cut down an Iroko tree in West Africa, nobody knows how old it is. It might have 10 rings and be 100 years old. It might have 60 rings and be five years old because they just put down bands of whatever they put down as they feel like. The best way to, to um, age a tropical timber is to have a record of when it was planted. <laughs> Most tropical timbers now, um, at least the commercial ones, um, have been planted and replanted and there are records of when they were planted. And it's no good saying, well, it's it's a metre diameter, so it must be 100 years old, because I've seen um, trees in the tropics that are a metre diameter and are 10 or 15 years old. And I've seen trees in colder climates that are only about 300 millimetres diameter and might be nearly a thousand years old. So it, it, the size of tree is no guide to the age of the tree. But the the um, darker pieces of this black and white photograph, those are the pores, those are holes, those are tubes. And back to what Vincent was saying, um, Iroko uh, has quite large pores, so it's quite a coarse texture. We talked about texture in the softwoods, that's generally the growth rate. The wider the growth rings in a, in a fast grown softwood, the poorer the texture is. But with, with hardwoods, especially with the diffuse porous hardwoods, and especially so with the tropical hardwoods, what gives them their texture is the size of the pores relative to the distribution of the fibers. The bigger the pores and the fewer the fibers, the more coarse and open the texture of the wood. And again, that affects its, its taking finishes and so on. But the smaller the pores and the more scattered they are and the more fibers are distributed amongst the pores, then generally speaking, the, the denser and the finer the texture is the timber. And here's an example of the difference between the, the diameter of a fibre, these little holes, and the diameter of a typical pore, these very, very big holes. And most um, hardwoods, it's possible to, to look at them um, with a, a, a magnifier, just a, a times 10 or a times 20 handheld magnifying lens, and you can see a huge amount of detail. Whereas for the softwoods, because the trachees are so tiny, you can only see them under two or 300 times magnification under a microscope. So uh, if I was identifying a softwood, I'd need to take a microscope slide for identifying most of the common hardwoods. I could do that with a sharp knife and the end grain and just look down a, a very small um, jeweler's magnifying loop, as they're called. So much, much easier to, to cope with, with recognizing hardwoods. These, these are the rays, these long lines that, that are going. So these rays are going across the wood, whereas the tubes of the pores and the fibers are coming out of the picture towards us. We are looking down the length of the tree trunk in this picture. Okay, these are just uh, uh, showing some, some different components. We've talked about it before. There's the, the heartwood. Uh, wherever that ends depending on the age of the tree and how it formed and there's the sapwood and then you've got the, the the growth rings the early wood and the late wood and then these are the sections the transverse face is a slice across the tree trunk across the grain and then in line with the rays going from the outside towards the center a radius in a circle if you're looking at that face you're looking at the radial face if you're looking around the curve of the growth rings and looking into that face there you are looking at a tangent to a circle, so you're looking at the tangential face. It's just geometry, basically. And then you've got the um, inner bark, which takes part in the growing of the tree. It brings the foodstuffs down that have been made in the leaves. 
you've got something you can't see on this picture, but the cambium is the actual living layer of the tree where the cells are dividing to form new wood or to new or new bark to form uh, the diameter of the tree to form the height of the tree, etc, etc. And then you've got the uh, outer bark, which is the old inner bark that eventually forms a crust and falls off sometimes with the pollution with it. Um, just quick shown a picture of, a, of some harvesting going on. This is in northern Sweden. Um, these trees, I thought there was a, a virgin forest. They're actually 120 years old when they were cutting them down and they were first harvested by hand, by axe and saw in the 1880s. And I saw these in about the 2010s. So they were well over uh, 130 years old by the time they were being cut down. And yet they're only three to 400 millimeters diameter because we're talking about only 100 kilometers south of the Arctic Circle. So very, very slow growth rate. You can see the snow on the ground there. And that's the harvester, a very clever gadget. There's, there's the scale of the tree in the forest. There's a man sitting in a cab. So you can see how big and how long these trees are. Um, and this harvester, grabs the tree, slices it off at the bottom. It's in the process of tipping it over, but when it gets to horizontal, it's fed through the machine head, the branches are stripped off, and then it's cut into lengths to go to the sawmill. And the next picture shows the cut lengths being um, carried by the forwarder to being stacked on the forest floor, ready to be taken off to the sawmill. Um, and those harvesters can cut um, about three to four trees per minute per minute through the forest. So they cut hundreds of trees a day, thousands of trees a week, and most sawmills that I've ever been to will take a hundred lorry loads of logs like that every week to be processed. And yet we're still growing more wood than we are cutting down because trees are amazing. Okay, a quick recap then, wood structure and properties. The grain, the direction of the wood fibers influences, I think, at least three main properties. It influences the strength. The straighter the grain, the stronger is the wood. Without doubt, if the grain is distorted or at an angle, the wood is more likely to break when it's under stress. And the wilder the grain with distortion of the grain, the harder it is to get the timber to dry without it losing its shape because it will move about a lot if the grain isn't straight. And if you've got wavy grain, which was in the uh, fiddleback violin, or interlock grain, which happens in a lot of tropical timbers, or spiral, which is like where the tree grows at a corkscrew twist, that can make it very difficult when you're machining to get a good smooth finish because the grain isn't flat on the surface. The grain, the fibers are sticking up to the surface all the while you're trying to plane it and sand it. So, but interestingly, the better the grain of the wood and the stronger the wood, the more boring it is to look at. So the more interesting looking woods, the timbers with good figure, are generally those where the grain is not behaving itself. They look lovely, but they're a bugger to get to work properly. Um, we've talked about the hardwood. Yeah. Yes, sure, yeah. sorry, yes, Doug, yes. Um, um, oh, sorry, um, I was just gonna jump in before you change topic, but uh, yeah, yeah. Yuri, asked, uh, Yuri asked a question about, um, if you would please say a few words about extractives, uh, right. Well, that's the next one. <laughs> it's the next. It's the next. The next slide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, the, okay. There yeah, you go. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The extractives are what the what we wood scientists refer to of the deposits in the heartwood. They may change the colour. They don't always. And things like the silicate in iroko, the tannins in oak, um, the chemicals that can affect the colour and sometimes affect the resistance to decay, the durability, and, and again, like the silicates in Iroko, can sometimes affect the machining properties. Um, and the, the, the paler or darker colour might indicate this natural durability, but paler does not always equal lower resistance to decay. There are some fairly pale timbers that have quite a good resistance, and darker does not necessarily mean better. There are some quite dark timbers that have quite a poor resistance to decay, and there are some relatively pale timbers that have a better resistance to decay. So it's not like a colour chart. In general, but there's always exceptions, the paler timbers are less durable than the darker timbers, but, but don't rely on it. And the only thing that is true is that all sapwood is not durable. And of course, if you have a low durability timber, you could think for certain uses to put chemical preservatives, although of course we're trying to avoid certain chemicals now, and the, the, the holy grail is to try to extract some of the natural chemicals from timbers, um, but it's easier said than done. Um, and I, I sit on the International Research Group on Wood Protection, and for about 30 years we've now been trying to get 
artificial uh, preservatives out of trees as opposed to using chemicals. But we're not there. We're not there yet. Durability is rated in five categories as a, a European standard EN350, and the, the, the top of the pops, number one durability, which are things like Iroku, things like Greenheart from South America, uh, rated very durable. They will last 50 years uh, stuck in the ground without any preservative. Durable things like oak, moderately durable things like uh, Douglas fir, slightly durable things like pine, not durable. Um, a lot of very pale timbers. A beech is not durable. Um, it's a lovely timber, but it, it doesn't last well out of doors. And as it says there, this, cl this class is the sapwood of all wood species. And if you want to, to take it a little further, I know I'm rushing through at a gallop, sorry about this. Um, there's another European standard 335 uh, for different use classes. If it's in use class one dry, doesn't matter what the wood is, it's never going to rot because it's never going to get wet. But if it's going to get wet, oops, sorry, I was moving, mean to move the cursor. If it gets wet in various categories of wet, indoors and covered, but occasionally perhaps high humidity in a roof space or outdoors like a cladding or, or whatever, um, and ground contact like uh, fence posts or um, uh, gates, uh, lock gates in a jetty, something like that in, in, in fresh water. As you go down the list, the hazard gets greater and the requirement for a durable timber gets more and more important or a good preservative. And then finally you get salt water uh, in the sea where you need to resist not just the, the water, but you need to resist uh, marine organisms. And I love the names of these. The, the, the ship worm is, is called the Tirido. And the one I really like is the one that eats um, jetty piles. And that's called the Gribble, which rhymes with nibble, which is what they do. They, 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 they nibble away at the, at the piles. So if you want to, um, uh, don't sit down too long at the beach or your piles will be eaten. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry about that, Doug. Um, moisture in wood, very quickly, moisture in wood, very important. Um, moisture content, it's, it, we talk about moisture contents for indoor or outdoor wood. The most important thing is, is by weight compared to the dry weight of wood. So if I'm taking a piece of wood at 10% moisture content, it's what the wood would, would have been if I dried it completely in an oven and then I'd put back 10% weight of moisture. So, and it's perfectly possible for uh, a freshly felled tree to have 150 or 180 or 200 percent moisture content because it can have more than its own weight of water in the tree. It can have one and a half or twice its own weight of water inside the tree at the moment it is felled because those tubes are full of water. Water is very heavy. Wood structure is very light. Uh, normally, if you're measuring on site like I do, Use a moisture meter. This is indoor timber. You can perhaps see it says 9.7, 10%. We always round up to the nearest whole number. And that is how you measure timber for general practice. But the correct, accurate way of doing it is to take a sample, weigh it, dry it, weigh it, dry it, and then do the calculation as per um, percentage of weight. Here's a very quick graph. When wood is very wet or green, nothing to do with environmental, wet wood is referred to as green wood by those who buy and sell it and it's, there's time going along to the left to right, and it, it dries very much more rapidly at first, but the lower the moisture content you need, the slower it gets and the longer time it takes to get dry. And here's some typical levels. That's most important to remember, 20%. If wood is under 20%, it cannot, will not, never will rot. So keep it dry below 20 and you're safe from rot. Most buildings with rot in them, the water's got in through penetrating stone walls or leaking roofs and the moisture content's gone somewhere above 20%. Claddings and things outdoors will be around 15, 16, 17% in our climate. Obviously different um, moisture contents in different climates around the world. In the tropics where it's much more humid, that moisture content could be higher. Indoors in central heating, in the UK, 10, 12%. In the USA, where you've got a lot of air conditioning, which dries the air, lowers the humidity, it'll be down somewhere near the five, six, seven percent um, moisture content. And if you're using a moisture meter, because they're measuring not moisture, they measure electrical resistance of the wood, you cannot get a reading below 6% with a meter. So um, uh, you just will get nothing on your dial at all, which means the wood is, is dry, but you don't know how dry. And, and I've come across um, air conditioned wood that can be four or five percent. Um, 
different timbers have different categories of how they move, how they, how they swell and shrink in reaction to moisture. I've just given you some examples. Quebec yellow pine, for example, is a very good softwood that has small movement. Um, a medium movement, most timbers are medium. So there's European redwood, which is pine and oak. Uh, and then beech, which is a famous one for large movement. But generally speaking, if you've got um, changing conditions, heat, heating turned on, turned off, um, summer, winter, then as the humidity conditions change, the moisture in the wood will change. And if you've got a low movement timber, small movement timber, it will be more stable and won't give you so much trouble as a large movement timber. So I, I would never use beech in a situation of high humidity. I would always keep it indoors in a centrally heated environment, such as in furniture. Okay, right, last few yeah, minutes. Just, just to let yeah. you know the sure, time, sure. It's, it's just going quarter to three. Yeah, quarter, yeah. To, quarter to eight, your time. Yeah, I'm gonna, gonna give some very, very quick examples, half a dozen or less very quick examples. Um, talking about wood texture, uh, this is a, a, a shuttle in a loom. It's pointed at both ends. Um, weaving looms work, at least mechanical ones, work by having a, um, a bat that hits the shuttle backwards and forwards across the loom when the, when the warp and the weft are moved, because that's the threads that go along the cloth, are moved around, and then the, the cross thread has to be put through. Now, obviously, Traditional weaving is done by hand, but mechanical weaving, it's done by the shuttle full of thread and it's literally bashed, it's hit and fired across through the, through the threads. And, and these, these shuttles have to put up with a lot of impact. So you need a very fine textured, very strong timber. Um, traditionally in this country, they were made of sycamore, but this example happens to be made of mahogany, which again is a very uh, fine textured, very hard wearing timber. Uh, this is a historical example that was was found in an antique shop. Uh, the Windsor chair I'm going to talk about quickly. This uh, very traditional English chair has a beech frame and an elm seat. Its main features are that the legs are separate from the back and the arms. Most furniture, most chairs that you're sitting on, the arms and the back run through to form the legs. The front arms usually run down to the front legs and the, the back rest usually runs down to form the back legs. But the Windsor chair is very different. So here's a, a typical Windsor chair. You can see it has this curved beach back and beach um, uh, rail. Sometimes in some models they're slats and the arms going onto the seat and I've turned it over so you can see where the where the fixings for the back and the arm rests actually slot into the seat and the legs are completely different. They're in a separate little frame like a stool that's slotted into its own locations in the elm seat. Here's a close up of the seat. Elm is a wonderful timber. Unfortunately, we lost most of our elm in the 1970s due to Dutch elm disease. And you can see how thin the elm seat is. Elm is an incredibly strong timber. It has a very tight grain structure. That means it's very strong and can be kept very thin. And this seat is molded. There's a, there's a little hump in the seat there. Traditionally, these were adzed out to, to make space for the, for the buttocks, for your bottom to sit on to. But I love the pattern of elm. Um, it's to do with the, the way in which the cells are formed. It's a hardwood, of course, and it's partly to do with the growth rings, the ring porous structure of the timber. It's also partly to do with certain other cells that I haven't had time to go into. But it forms, if you can see, like a partridge breast feather pattern. Can you see that in my picture? It, anyway, craftsmen used to call it partridge wood, is the old name for elm. And then the back. You can see beech is amazing. It's very strong, it's very fine textured timber, incredibly strong, so it can be very thin and still support a person's weight sitting on the chair. But the most amazing thing about the Windsor chair is it can be, beech can be bent to a very, very tight radius of curvature. You steam it and soften it, and then you can bend it to a very, very tight curvature of radius. And there's very few timbers that will bend without buckling and creasing on the inside of the curve. So that's really the reason why beech became the preeminent furniture timber. And it happens very handily that beech and elm grew in the same forests in the Chiltern Hills, which is why High Wycombe was the centre of the furniture trade and the chair making industry right through Victorian times, right up to the 1970s and 80s. And this is an Urkol chair, uh, E-R-C-O-L, Urkol, which is one of the most famous brands of chair probably in the world. Pitch pine, just a quick view, end grain, side grain. This is the pattern, the figure of the growth rings. True pitch pine is Pinus carabea, Caribbean pitch pine. 
a lot of people tell me when I've been investigating buildings, oh, that's made of pitch pine, and it usually isn't, um, because it's usually something like southern pine, Pinus palustris, Pinus eleotii, main species from the southern states of the USA, but they're not true pitch pine. Pitch, as our New York man will, and probably Doug, you'll know as well, pitch is the North American term for resin. These are very, very resinous timbers. And mistakenly, southern pine was sometimes known as uh, uh, shortleaf pitch pine, but true pitch pine is Pinus carabea. It, it is used in historic buildings and you can still obtain it. There's a, a firm I, I deal with who, who imports pitch pine to this day. Last example, AQS Warrior. Um, I was lucky enough to actually be able to do the original survey when they found the hulk of this first and last ironclad battleship. It was moved up to Hartlepool and, and in the 1980s, I did the survey on the, on the hull. It's ironclad, but it's a wooden hull made of teak, Tectona grandis, and I was the one who actually said, yes, it's worth restoring. So the reason you can go down to Portsmouth docks and see Warrior is because I said it was worth saving. So my little claim to fame. And then lastly, very quickly on um, ships, red oak and white oak. This is a naval story. You've heard of the Mary Celeste, the mystery of the ship that was found abandoned? Yeah? People have heard of the Mary Celeste? Yeah? Say yes, somebody. Yes. <laughs> it, it, was, it, it, it sailed from New York Harbour, bound for Genoa in Italy in 1872, and they found it somewhere off the um, Canaries, I think. Um, abandoned, no crew on board, nobody knew why it was abandoned. It was never, never established why it was abandoned. But interestingly, it was carrying barrels of alcohol. And when it finally was recovered and taken to a port and the, the salvagers sold off the cargo of these barrels of alcohol, a number of them were found to be empty. And they thought, well, there's another mystery for you. But it was no mystery because when they examined it, most of the barrels were made of white oak, American white oak, which is the, the, the right hand picture here. And some of them, a few dozen of the barrels, had been wrongly made out of red oak. And red oak and white oak look very similar. By the way, not all red oak is pink and not all white oak is white. Uh, it's not the wood colour. It's to do with the, 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 the white oak. The white oak has um, white underside of the leaves and the red oak has a reddish bark. And you can get red oak that looks pale and you can get white oak that looks pink. So it's not the colour of the wood. The difference is the wood is porous. White oak is not porous. Red oak is porous. So I'm going to come out of my share and at the very last minute I'm going to do a little magic trick for you. Can, can you all see me? Yeah. 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 Right. Yes. I've got a piece, a piece of white oak here and I'm going to blow in the end grain. <coughs> and I've got pink in the face <coughs> and I can't blow through it. But I've got some red oak here which I can blow through and I'm going to dip it into some um, fairy liquid, some, some washing up liquid, and you can see, I hope, if I go sideways, what happens. Uh, can you see that? Uh, Blowing bubbles uh, through the timber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we are, that's it, done. Wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. Um, if everybody can unmute.